Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's MSCI Optimum Safety Webinar on Incident Investigations. We appreciate your attending. Uh, I want to make everybody aware uh, as we go along here that you are going to be muted for the duration of the call, but you can submit questions via the question capability and go to webinar. If you look at the control panel, once you've logged in, you'll see that you can submit questions as Steve presents for the next 45 minutes, and I'd encourage you to do so. And then once we're at the end of the webinar and the formal presentation, um, I will read the questions to Steve that you have submitted. So you obviously, uh, we encourage you to do that so that you can get the most out of the webinar. Can you go to the next slide, Steve? Thank you. So uh, before we start, I just wanted to make everybody aware that MSCI is going to be holding its fifth annual safety conference. Uh, this year, we are co-locating our safety conference with the National Safety Council's Safety Conference and Expo, and that takes place in Anaheim, California. Uh, that conference is going to offer you, on October 19th and 20th, a couple of very unique opportunities that we would encourage you to take advantage of. Opportunity number one is all of the unique metals industry content that the MSCI conference offers. And the MSCI conference takes place on October 20th. That's a Thursday, all day. And the conference agenda that we are presenting has been planned and will be executed. And all of our speakers will be uh, industry members from uh, MSCI membership and the members of our safety committee. So that's going to be a very unique experience. It's not quite what we've done in the past, um, but when we looked at the responses that we got from everyone after the last four safety conferences, it was clear that we need to stick to our guns on metals industry content. So that's what we're going to offer. The other unique opportunity is to attend the NSC Congress and Expo, which is going to take place on October 19th. So for an additional $75, highly discounted, you will be able to gain access to the National Safety Council's Safety Trade Show, which features over a 1,000 safety exhibitors at the Anaheim Convention Center. So I would encourage everybody to take advantage of our early bird and online discounts and register for our safety conference as soon as possible before the hotels fill up out there in Anaheim because the NSC conference is a very large conference and it does fill the hotel space. So please take advantage of it. Discounts we're offering right now and get your hotel room reserved uh, before summer passes us by. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, which is uh, Steve Yates. Steve is the uh, president and the founder of Optimum Safety Management. I won't read you his bio, but I will say that Steve has done all of our quarterly safety webinars to date, has done a really good job. I think our members appreciate him being uh, willing to do this and offer these webinars on a, on a free basis to all of our members. And I want to yeah, also let you know that Steve, yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in a class. Steve is a um, very valuable member of MSCI. Steve's company is an affiliate member and a very valuable partner for us, uh, not in small part because he's willing to do these webinars. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve, and then we'll come back and do Q&A when Steve's finished with his formal presentation. Thanks. Steve? Chris, thanks uh, so much. I'm just trying to get the right slide up there. And uh, thanks for the great introduction and uh, the uh, valued information on the safety conference. Uh, we're going to be uh, in attendance with our staff there and uh, really looking forward to both the MSCI conference as well as the um, that. We're going to dive right into – Chris, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with that, we're going to dive right into our topic today for uh, incident investigation. Uh, what I want to do just by way of introduction is just to talk about why it's important that we even think about or engage in this topic of incident investigation. Um, some of the things that uh, make this important are, number one, it's an OSHA requirement. 
OSHA does have a regulatory requirement that we investigate any incident that occurs. Uh, we find this in a number of places in the standards, but uh, certainly none, uh, the least of which is the uh, 1904 record keeping standard, the OSHA log. Uh, probably most of the callers are uh, familiar with the OSHA 300 log. Um, so there are some requirements in, uh, in the OSHA standards for us to do it. The main purpose behind that is investigating the incident to determine root causes so that we can mitigate the risk and not have that same incident occur again in the workplace. In addition, it's very important that we do this because of the insurance requirements. Uh, workers' compensation insurance costs can be one of the largest costs uh, on to the bottom line of a business uh, that can actually be mitigated when it comes to good safety practices. So it's a very important practice to control our workers' compensation insurance costs and prevent future incidents. The biggest question is what happens if we don't investigate? You know, we could have incidents that are occurring within our workplace that uh, we won't find the cause of, and then we can have repetitive incidents. Uh, many of the workplaces that we walk into um, struggle with things like PPE use, but yet they have a, a large frequency of foreign body to the eye uh, injuries, and they wonder why those are uh, not being mitigated or that they're still happening. And a lot of times when we look at their incident investigation process, we find out that they really don't do an accurate incident investigation. So I hope to share with uh, the audience today some things that will kind of heighten our awareness of why we need to do it and hopefully bring some things to you that will help uh, in your investigative process to mitigate some of these risks and actually eliminate some of the hazards that you find uh, commonly in your workplace. Uh, there's great benefits in improved prevention and safety. But we can't, as safety professionals and operations managers, always find every hazard uh, to our employees, uh, to our uh, own dismay, right? We'd like to think that uh, we can do the best job of finding all of the different things that happen or could happen within our workplaces, but unfortunately, we don't always find them all. Um, there are tremendous benefits in prevention and safety if we can do uh, adequate and uh, effective incident investigation. And then obviously, the overall cost of incidents and uh, being reduced, this is not only the uh, monetary or financial costs, but the cost of human capital. Um, so as we have uh, our valued assets, the most valuable asset of a business being its employees, there's a tremendous cost to the employee, the families, uh, the community, uh, the business itself as people are injured in the workplace. So we want to reduce those costs of human capital as well as then the financial costs. When we start talking Incident investigation, uh, I would be remiss <clears throat> if I didn't present uh, for a minute on Heinrich's Triangle. Uh, this is a study that was done many years ago on uh, large accident pools. And what was discovered was that for every one serious injury that occurs, um, maybe a, a fatality or a, a serious uh, uh, fracture or that type of thing, there were 29 minor injuries that led up to that that could have possibly predicted it. Uh, 29 uh, minor injuries that if we were able to eliminate those, we might have been able to eliminate the serious injury. Prior to that, in his studies, he found that there were 300 non-injury incidents, or what a lot of people refer to as near misses, uh, that could have been predictors. And then as we look at the broader base of activities within a workplace, he found that there were potentially 700,000 unsafe behaviors. A lot of people think Heinrich had a lot of time in his hands as he was counting all of these unsafe behaviors. But it's a very interesting study because as we realize the unsafe behaviors can be a predictor of all the way up to the serious injury. And the more unsafe behaviors we eliminate, the smaller the base of our triangle gets, which means the less near misses we're going to have and the less minor injuries and hopefully totally eliminate that serious injury, which might have been a fatality. Now, as safety professionals and those concerned with safety and maybe with safety as a part of our job responsibilities or titles, we want to utilize this study. And the way that we teach on this when we're talking with operations managers, safety professionals, even frontline supervisors or workers, is we want to utilize the data out of Heinrich's Triangle as a target. Uh, it would be very poor of us to do safety 
in the bullseye method only utilizing this study and, and this target. Because if we wait for trying to shoot at the bullseye of this and we wait for this, the single injury, the most severe injury to occur before we do an investigation or we, before we try to mitigate a risk, what that means is that somebody has suffered a very significant injury before we're taking action. And I think we'd all relate to the fact that that's not best practice for safety. As we look at the next ring out, though, we start to look at our less serious injuries. Maybe these are first aid injuries or uh, scrapes, slight cuts, that type of thing. Uh, that's getting better. If we can capture data even on first aids, and many of the workplaces that we work in don't actually capture that data, there's very few that we find that uh, we'll begin to investigate or look at first aid incidents. So we want to make sure we're stepping out and capturing those. The most proactive workplaces we see, uh, or many of the most proactive workplaces we see, will begin to actually incorporate near-miss data. Uh, drop load with a crane will be investigated. Um, near-miss forklift incidents will be investigated. Uh, near-misses with machine tools or machine guarding issues will be investigated. And this is getting even better because now we're preventing many more injuries than waiting until we have the more serious ones. But the absolute best is to begin to examine the workplace for unsafe behaviors, uh, utilizing things like um, uh, some of the behavioral-based programs where we do safety observations and counsel with employees and discuss um, activities that they're doing that could be considered unsafe. Uh, the workplaces that are beginning to engage in those types of activities and looking further and further out on this target are the ones that have the absolute best incident rates within their workplaces, and they're eliminating many more of these incidents than, uh, than others. So just some things to think about and the importance of accurate and effective incident investigation as we get started. So as we continue our introduction, we've talked about uh, some of the benefits, but here's some additional ones. So incident prevention, identifying training needs. Um, obviously, we're able to prevent further incidents of the same type. But if we do a good and effective incident investigation, we also identify training needs within our workplace where uh, somebody, uh, you might identify that uh, you need to enhance uh, torch cutting safety training or a particular aspect within it as you've done your root cause analysis, some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, the other is that you can identify strengths in your workplace from a safety standpoint. And these are great opportunities for encouraging your management, encouraging your supervisors and your workforce, the actual people that are working on the front line. You can use your incident investigation as a, actually as a morale booster, um, encouraging people that they've been doing the right thing. Uh, so when you find those things, don't just look for the negatives, look for the positives and use it as a morale booster. You can also improve your operations. Uh, we know with good quality measures that we always improve production and lost time uh, due to rework and so on. The same thing occurs with safety. The more effective incident investigation we do, the better we improve our operations. If this is done properly, it can also boost your employee engagement. Getting employees involved in the process, getting them involved in troubleshooting and solution providing um, can really help to engage your workplace. So a uh, lot of benefits to incident investigation when it's done right. We want to talk about now some of the methods on how we're actually going to do that. One of the things that uh, is a cornerstone is we have to step back and develop an approach to how we're going to do adequate and uh, effective incident investigation. When is the best time to develop your approach? The obvious answer to that question is before something occurs. When something occurs within your workplace, it's not time then to step back and say, OK, scratch my head. What do you think I should do now? Uh, effective incident investigation is always planned ahead of time. So what we're going to walk through within our webinar today is we're going to walk through this outline. We're going to talk about how do we respond to the incident immediately? What's our immediate response tactic? We're going to talk about how we are going to investigate the incident, some things to think about there. 
we're going to talk about analyzing your findings and determining root cause. Then we're going to talk about making recommendations for corrective action. This is very important that we do this well and that we do it thoroughly and we make good and accurate and effective usable recommendations. Next, implementing changes. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get buy-in? How are we going to make sure that people actually engage the changes we're talking about? And lastly, what about the follow-up activities? We want to make sure we're getting the results that we set out to get. So how do we do accurate follow-up and adequate follow-up? So let's dive right in. Let's talk about the response. Okay, First thing, right? Something happens in your workplace. What are the things that you're going to do to respond to this? First thing, obviously, is to care for the injured worker, if there are any. And you may be responding to incidents that don't actually have an injured worker involved. We still need to have a good response, investigation, root cause analysis, all the other things we just talked about. But primary, we want to respond and care for that injured worker. So that may be uh, responding by calling 911, calling your emergency responders in. You may have an emergency response team within your own facility. However you deem that you're going to respond to emergencies, you need to have that as part of your response tactic. The people that are responsible for first responding need to be aware of it, and they need to know what that, what that looks like, and they need to be trained on it. Don't forget, if you're going to respond to an incident by calling EMS services, you want to make sure that somebody is dispatched outside of your facility to look for them and then notify them where the response needs to occur within your facility and escort them into that area. Uh, we don't want to have EMS responding to a 200,000 square foot facility with 12 entrances around its perimeter and not knowing where to go or which, which entrance to respond to. Next thing we want to do is we want to secure the scene. It's very important that we secure the incident scene. Now, disturbing the scene to respond to an injured worker, that's one thing. That needs to be done, and we don't want to worry too much about the incident scene as far as getting to the worker, removing things out of the way to get EMS in, in to the area. But as soon as we can, we want to begin securing the, the evidence around that scene. There's investigations that need to be performed by multiple parties. There's many different stakeholders, people like your insurance carriers and so on. And we want to make sure that we prevent spoilation of evidence. Um, in the event, uh, in particular, of a fatal worker injury, uh, that is a crime scene until the police determine that it is not. So they even have, a, they are even a stakeholder. And we want to make sure that we prevent any spoilation of evidence. So you've got to preserve all of the incident evidence that's there. That might mean caution tape, keeping people out of the area, and so on. And then you're going to want to begin contacting stakeholders. In order to do this, you need a predefined call tree. You want to have a list of the people that you want to contact in a defined order and make sure that management is contacted very early on in the process. Uh, if the incident requires that you contact outside counsel, uh, you may have third-party consultants such as Optimum or a safety consultant who's going to come in and assist with that incident investigation. Um, you might have forensics folks that need to come in if a crane was involved. There could be a whole host of different people, but you want to have a predefined list of who and how you would contact them and when. And then for more information on this, uh, the very first webinar that we did for MSCI back in March of 2015 uh, was a webinar with Matthew Horn from Smith Amundsen, who's also uh, a member with MSCI, uh, available to assist members in the event that you have incidents like this. Um, Matt and I discussed responding to catastrophic incidents, and I actually have a handout that was given during that webinar that's loaded into your webinar handout section for today, and you can feel free to download that along with the other materials that are there. So once we get through the response, now we're into the investigation process. And we want to be prepared for this and use a pre-formatted approach for consistency. We want to make sure that you have uh, things like incident investigation forms and witness statements and so on. Uh, Optimum clients have access to our Optimum Incident Response System, and that's a trained process that we take a client through, and they have vehicle diagrams and all types of different forms 
for collecting witness statements and sending somebody off to the clinic, uh, even with medical instruction forms and so on. So you want to make sure that you have that type of a pre-formatted approach so that you can have a consistent incident investigation as you go through this process. You want to ask thorough questions using the five W's. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why. They throw an H in there if you'd like and ask a little bit about how it happened. But we want to make sure that we're gathering details through this investigation process. As we go through our investigation, we want to inspect the scene. When we teach our safety professionals here that they need to do this at a couple of different levels. First is at an overall level. When you walk into an incident scene, it's very easy to get drawn into a detail within the scene and lose sight of some of the other aspects. So we want to step back. Maybe we don't do that right away at the beginning, kind of get your bearings, but step back and look at the overall level. We want to take pictures of the overall scene so that there's a kind of a road map from outside of the scene that you can piece together the incident with some more of the detailed photos you're going to take at a detail level as you move into the scene. You want to collect samples. If there's um, a material that was involved or a, a dust that was involved or um, things like, uh, let's say there was a uh, uh, Hilti uh, ram or a ram set gun that was involved, you want to collect some of the loads or some of the pins that were used or any of the different items that were involved in the incident. You want to make sure you're collecting both photographs and samples of that material. You want to do that when you take photographs very carefully. One of the issues that we have is that when we walk into an incident scene, we might be investigating something that occurred with a uh, soil pile, let's say maybe a utility hit, and we end up with photographs that are detail taken very close to the soil or the soil pile, and then we end up with pictures that were taken at a distance. Um, and both of those photos look exactly the same. Whether you're lump looking at a clump of dirt or a large pile of dirt, the photograph doesn't denote the scale. So what we do often is if we're taking a picture of something that's small, we'll put a pen in the photo or a, a tape measure, or I'll have my boot in the photo as I'm looking down taking a photograph of something. And I'm including an item of scale so that I can see the size of the object relative to something in the area. Uh, within a plant environment, you might take a picture of something like an ingoing nip point between two rolls. If you take that picture wide and you've got two four-foot diameter cylinders with an ingoing nip point, or you're focused in very tight in between two two-inch diameter cylinders with an ingoing nip point, your photograph might look the same. So include items of scale, tape measures, pens, other items that would denote some scale. I think you get the idea there. Um, but we want to document, document, document as we inspect the scene. And we're going to talk about some items to gather here in a little bit. But we want to make sure as we're gathering photographs and other documentation, make sure that you're documenting well. You only get one chance to document that scene. Because within a day or so, as all of the stakeholders have worked their way through, depending on how big of an incident this is, uh, this scene now gets disturbed and restored to normal, and you'll lose your opportunity to document. One of the main things that we do when we do an incident investigation is we interview witnesses. And if we have an incident that has five witnesses, and I walk onto the scene and I gather all of my witnesses together, and I say, OK, I, want, I need to interview you all. So uh, interview uh, or witness one, uh, please tell me what you saw. And then witness two, tell me what you saw. And I do that when they're all together. By the time I get to witness three, their story is sounding more and more like witness one and two. By the time I get to five, it's a blended story. So you want to make sure that you segregate your witnesses, separate them, and keep them uh, kind of sequestered on their own. Uh, and then at that point, you're going to interview each one of them privately. When we interview them, we want to place emphasis on fact-finding, not fault-finding. Uh, questions uh, or statements like, so you were involved in this, weren't you? You know exactly what happened. Any of that accusatory tone is off-limits during uh, interviews. 
We want to make sure that we're asking them about facts. We want to use open-ended questions. We want to make sure we're asking questions like, can you tell me what you saw today while you witnessed this incident? And they'll give you a broad idea. And then as you ask more detailed questions, you'll ask things like, so when you watch the employee approach the machinery, can you tell me a little bit more about what you saw there? Uh, you wouldn't ask a question like, when the employee was approaching the machinery, uh, did he have his hands in front of him? You, you, the answer you're going to get is yes or no. You want to ask a question like, when you saw the employee approaching the machine, where were his hands? And then we'll describe that to you. So we want to make sure we use open-ended questions, not questions that could be answered with a yes, no, or a grunt. Right? We want to make sure that they have to give you a sentence to answer. This is one of the biggest things that I have a challenge with when I'm doing a, an incident investigation is not drawing conclusions during the interview. We want to make sure that we don't walk into a scene, talk to a couple of the witnesses, start looking at things, and draw a conclusion right away. Because the rest of our investigation, we will spend trying to prove our own hypothesis. And that's a dangerous thing for an investigator. We have to stay out of the uh, emotional involvement with it. We have to stay away from drawing conclusions, stay open during the process. So this is a great communication tactic. Next, we want to sound back to the interviewee what we're hearing. So they tell you something, and you say, OK, so let me make sure I have that right. What you're saying is, when he approaches the machine, his hands were in front of him, stretched out, reaching. And they'll say yes or no, that's correct, or they'll clarify for you. Um, it's OK to ask your interviewees, what do you think caused this incident today? After you're done with the rest of your fact finding, that can help because they may have a different perspective. And then you might want to explore that. Always be thankful for your, the help that your interviewees have given you. We want to make sure that they know that we appreciate their input and remind them if they have any other thoughts later about something that comes up they want to come and talk to you about, the investigation is still open. Please feel free to come bring that feedback. As we move on, we want to make sure during the investigation that we're gathering any paperwork or other documentation. So any pertinent prior accident investigations or incident investigations that were done, OSHA logs might be a good uh, tool to use that would give uh, some indication of where the company has had um, some other incidents like this that you can then determine further potential root causes that you want to go investigate in this incident. Any drawings, specifications, other pertinent documents, uh, don't be afraid to overuse your camera where you might have a inspection crane or a forklift that was involved. Uh, take that, lay it down on a bench, and take a photograph of it. That puts it right into your documentation. You don't need to worry then about keeping track of that piece of paper. You've secured the evidence right away, and it's part of your record. So utilize your photography for that. On the analysis now, so we've gathered a lot of information. We're going to talk about the analysis. When we look at analysis and we want to drive down to root cause levels, we want to think about this in three different levels. We want to think about the fatality or the lost workday case, the OSHA recordable case, the first aid, the near miss, or the property damage. These are all consequences. They're conditions that exist in the organizations with reactive safety cultures. Sometimes they'll, they'll exist or they'll happen within an organization with a good safety culture, right? Because Bad things do happen to good organizations. Let me say that again. Bad things do happen to good organizations. We can't always fix every problem, like I mentioned earlier. But these first five tiers are measures of failure. They're after the fact. They're what we would call lagging indicators. They're indicators of a potential hazard that we're going to look at after the hazard has resulted in an incident. So they're very important to look at. But what we're talking about now is we're going deeper than that when we do our investigation. And we're looking at activities. That's the next tier. We're looking at unsafe practices or procedures or conditions that occur or, or exist within the work environment. We're going to utilize those top two tiers 
the consequence and the activity, we're going to utilize those to help us determine what the root causes are. These are always the underlying issues that exist under every, let me say that again, every incident that occurs. There's always an underlying cause, but we need to do our job in the investigation to find that root cause. So what are some of those? Well, it could be things like the design of a piece of equipment or a machine guard or the design of a blade that's being used. It could be a policy or a procedure that we have in place that is creating a problem. It may have not been done effectively uh, in a root cause or a uh, pardon me a hazard analysis, uh, job hazard analysis to eliminate all the potential hazards that exist. So we want to look at our policies that surround the incident. It might be a training issue. Maybe we're training people only so far. And then we want to look at how far should we be going. And if we had trained them a little bit deeper, could we actually have eliminated this incident? Could be purchasing. I will tell you that I've investigated several incidents over the course of my career where we had uh, determined that the purchasing department changed the blade on a saw. They wanted to cheapen it up. And maybe it was a diamond tool, so it was a very expensive tool. They wanted to buy a cheaper one. And what we found was the cheaper one didn't last as long or withstand the heat or the intensity of the operation we were putting it through. And then we had teeth of that blade flying off, destroying saws, potentially uh, wounding our uh, workers in the area. So uh, we've got to always look at what's been done in purchasing the equipment. Inspection. Are we actually doing inspections of the equipment uh, on a daily basis or uh, on a monthly basis or on an annual basis? And then what about preventative maintenance? That's another issue that comes up when we talk about inspections. Preventative maintenance is a cause of many incidents within the workplace. Uh, is there a standard that we're just not following or not paying attention to? Um, what about employee involvement? Are the employees engaged and involved, or are they distant and therefore not following our procedures or their training? And one of the issues that comes up there is, are we even enforcing? Now, we have many meetings with management that to this one where management is simply not enforcing their, uh, their rules or their, their safety protocols and practices within the workplace. So oftentimes we find out, unfortunately, I hate to say this because we've got a lot of management reps on the phone, I'm sure. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we find out that we are the problem. Uh, we're not doing our job well enough in enforcing what we know to enforce, and then we have people that are unfortunately getting hurt. Uh, maybe the very one that's not following the policy that's getting hurt, but that doesn't sponge us of our responsibility to enforce. So as we think about these different root causes, that empowers us now in our analysis, just keep searching deeper for sources for the root cause. Is it the people? Is it the equipment? Sometimes it's the environment. It might be the work environment within our building. It might be a weather environment issue. It might be uh, road conditions. There could be all different types of environmental concerns. And then management, like I just discussed. And make sure that you keep asking why. And we want to go five times on why and keep digging. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, what did you observe today with the employee? Well, he was at the edge of the platform without his fall protection on. Well, why was that occurring? Well, he needed to see into the mixing drum. Well, why was he needing to see into the mixing drum? Well, the reason he had to go up onto the platform and see into the mixing drum was that the scale that weighs the material in the drum was not functional. Why was that scale not functional? Well, the scale wasn't functional because it broke two weeks ago. We've had a work order into maintenance and they've not been able to repair it yet. Why are they not able to repair it? Well, the part's back order. You see how as we keep digging and asking why, we get deeper and deeper into the root cause and maybe the root cause is we need to have backup scales on the shelf for our mixers if they go down, or we need to resource a better supplier and so on. And those then are going to lead us into making better recommendations 
as we move forward into the investigation. <clears throat> so with that segue, let's talk about recommendations. So in the example I just used where we have a waste scale hopper that's got a bad scale on it, we need to involve some other people to determine that, uh, determine the exact recommendation to make. It might be a good recommendation to have some on the shelf. It might not. It might be a good recommendation to go to a different supplier or change the way we're designing our waste scales or whatever it is in the operation that, that applies to your plant. So we want to involve others. That might be our maintenance department, our purchasing department, certainly operations, supervisors, maybe the mixer operator themselves or the operator of that press or whatever the equipment is within your facility. When we make a recommendation, we always want to involve those that it will affect before we finalize our recommendations. So as a safety professional, it's very easy for me to walk into an operating environment and start to make recommendations that will make it safer. However, I don't understand that operating environment like the people that are in it. So what I want to do is I want to look for solutions that actually solve the problem and eliminate possible solutions that cause other problems. Make sure, though, that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when we're doing this. So oftentimes what's happened is I've looked at a, an incident and I've said, well, what, if, what would happen if we solved it by doing this? Now note that I'm asking the question. I'm not making a statement saying, well, you solved that problem by doing this. That shuts down communication. And I might be making a very poor recommendation not knowing all the aspects of that production environment. So when I ask the question, what would happen if we solved the problem by doing this, I get responses like, actually, Steve, that won't work, but, you know, that's not a bad idea. What if we tweak it like this? Would that solve the problem and make it safer? And then we might come up with something even third, a third option that eliminates the safety problem but eliminates other problems and make sure that we always remember the simpler, the better. Uh, we don't need to create a new wheel here. Uh, most of the operations we do within our facilities um, have already been solved and explored, and simple solutions are always better. Um, we, we don't want to totally throw everything out that we're doing and create some new rocket uh, that uh, is going to solve it. Okay, so make sure we're we're keeping it simple. Uh, you all know the KISS analogy. I, I always say it's keep it simple, Steve. So we want to make sure that we, we keep things simple. All right, implementation. Now, some of the recommendations that you're going to want to implement as a uh, follow-up to uh, an incident investigation are going to require some buy-in. They're going to require some change. Uh, if you've been in a safety role for any length of time, you understand that Really, uh, you could sum your role up in uh, two words, and it's change management. Uh, you're really responsible to change people's behaviors, their work environments, the way they interact with them, the way management interacts with them and thinks with, about them. Um, the better you are at the relational aspects of change management, the better safety professional you are. Those are uh, learned skills. Don't worry if you don't have that skill today. Uh, that can be coached and learned. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're looking at those things and we're understanding them and that uh, we now understand that when we implement a new solution, we really are selling our recommendation to the team. We need to get buy-in. You need to look for advocates that can help you. Um, we need to make sure we understand the costs. Um, any change requires some cost of some level. It's going to require cost to implement in time or cost to implement in equipment changes and so on. You need to make sure you understand not only the direct costs, it's only going to cost $4,000 to buy that new piece of equipment. Well, that's great, but what about the wreck and removal costs of taking the old one out and then the retrofit to put the new one in and now training to get people up on board of that new solution you're providing. Some of these are very simple, right? It might be, you know, we're going to change the design of our lockout tagout locks to more standardize them, and it's $400. Everybody's got new locks, and we're off and running with a simple training. Um, the one I worked on, we were changing an entire 
mixing system within a plant for a concrete uh, operation. And it was a uh, hard cost of equipment of about $40,000 and another $50,000 to dig a pit, uh, bust the concrete out, dig a pit, concrete up the pit, install the equipment down in it, and put all the piping in place. Um, I had to understand the direct cost, but then I also needed to understand the indirect costs. That solution actually saved that facility hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next two to three years in the maintenance cost of the equipment that was in place versus the equipment that we were putting in place. It saved many man hours of maintenance, equipment, downtime, uh, spare parts being kept on a shelf, belts that had to be replaced. And the main reason we were looking at it was because we kept injuring employees' backs because of the manual labor operation the old system was causing. So there were great benefits, but we really needed to understand both direct and indirect costs. That took a little bit of study. And then also the long-term and short-term costs. Sometimes your solution will not have a payback or a return on investment, ROI, over the short term. You need to understand what your long-term return on investment is, and then you need to look for advocates that can help you sell it, create a plan, and most importantly, you've got to communicate it clearly and effectively to the powers that are, are over the decision. So you always have a decision maker, then you have influencers, and you have advocates or stakeholders. So the better job you can do in communicating clearly and in the language that your decision maker speaks, which nine times out of 10 in a production environment is dollars or time, which relates back to dollars. So if we can speak in currency uh, and, and equate everything to that, we have a much better success rate of actually getting our implementation put in place that's going to then improve quality of work environment, quality of life, health, safety, productivity, bottom line, et cetera. You get all of the advantages when you can sell it effectively. But again, more often than not, you've got to be able to communicate in bottom line dollars because that's how our management thinks. It's what business operates on is bottom line dollars and cents. We have to be able to equate that. Okay, once you do that, you're going to find that the business decisions are very easy for an upper manager to make, and they can support it and get on board. Uh, if you have any questions on that, I love talking about that type of thing. Bring them up in the Q&A. We can uh, go through some other examples, and uh, it's, a, it's actually a pretty uh, interesting topic. The follow-up. Here we are. So now we've implemented our solutions, and we want to talk about the follow-up. Why is it important that we do good, effective follow-up? Well, you set out with a solution that you've implemented, and you had a destination in mind. How will you know if you're still on course if you don't do good follow-up? And if you're the investigator and the one who's recommending it, you want your name attached to successful implementations because you need to be able to sell the next one. So you want to make sure that you track it, that you're on course, you have some metrics, things you're measuring. You need to have an understanding of where changes are needed. Again, back to the don't throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, analogy, we want to make sure that we understand where we can tweak our solutions to still get back on course without somebody looking at it and saying, that's not working, rip it out, go back to the old way. Because the old way didn't work either. It ended up causing an injury or a significant incident. We want to make sure also that we're achieving our incident reduction goal. So we should have a goal in mind. When we implement this solution, it should end up reducing this number of injuries or have this impact within our, our plant environment. And then we want to identify any system breakdowns. The system that we're implementing, is it breaking down anywhere? Are people having a hard time adapting to the, the new implementation? Do they need different PPE? Do we need to redo our hazard analysis? Uh, do they need better training? Do they need other equipment that's going to assist them in making it work right? And depending on the individual situation you're dealing with, these can be somewhat complex, or they can be very simple to tweak. But it's very important that we have an effective follow-up and make sure that we understand how we're, how we're getting to where we're, where we're looking to go. Okay, on that note, we're going to move into Q&A. I want to just make sure everybody's aware that in the uh, handout section of the webinar uh, control panel, 
you do have five handouts that are available there. We have the webinar slides. Uh, we do have the Preparing for Catastrophic Incidents guide that's there. And then I've also loaded the uh, three handouts on OSHA's top 10 most frequently cited standards for the metals industry in 2015. These are great tools and resources for you to use. We have one for metal service centers. We have one for mills. And then we have one for fabricating environments because many of our MSCI members have value-added fabrication within their facilities. So those are three great resources to help with some of your hazard assessments and looking for different incident or uh, hazard potential within your facility. On that note, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you to run our Q&A portion. Okay, thanks, Steve. We do have a number of questions here, but I'm going to start with uh, one that was asked right away. It's a, it's a question about definitions. Um, could you please just go back and make sure that everybody understands what it is you mean when you use the term stakeholders? Yes, yeah, excellent. Great question. Um, so stakeholders, when an incident occurs, let, let's take, for instance, the worst kind of an incident we can have. Let's talk about a a fatal incident within a workplace. When that occurs, obviously the worker themselves was a stakeholder in the incident. In addition to that, the employer is a stakeholder. They have investigation they want to do, they want to find out what happened, they want to prevent it in the future to protect the rest of their employees. They also have risk related to this incident and they want to mitigate the downstream risk of the the incident blowing up as far as litigation and so on. So they want to be able to capture data and uh, a good investigation of the incident right away. The other stakeholders, though, are the family of the injured worker. Um, that family has a stake in this incident from a death benefit standpoint, from a potential uh, subrogation, uh, which might be a new term to some of the folks on the call. Subrogation means other parties that uh, could be involved in a lawsuit as a result of this incident. <clears throat> so the equipment manufacturer, uh, if we're talking about a machine guarding incident on a uh, steel roll, um, we're, we've got the machine uh, manufacturer who could be a stakeholder. And um, because of that potential for subrogation, that machine manufacturer might need to be contacted uh, that's something that you should do with counsel's advice, uh, with your outside counsel or in-house counsel. Um, other stakeholders would be the police department. Uh, we've had incidents where uh, within a facility where a dust collector exploded, and the fire department was a stakeholder. Uh, excuse me, Chris. <clears throat> the uh, fire department was actually a stakeholder because they had a, an obligation to do a fire investigation because it was a fire within the dust collector that blew up, caused the explosion, and uh, and then ended up injuring a couple of employees. Um, your insurance carriers are all stakeholders. They have something to gain or lose from this incident. Um, the other one that we haven't mentioned yet is OSHA. OSHA is a stakeholder. They're going to want to come in and do their investigation. Um, I think that covers a lot of them. Uh, but uh, if you define a stakeholder who has something to gain or lose from that incident, uh, they would be defined as a stakeholder. And as a management team with your counsel, uh, in-house or outside counsel, uh, you would determine who gets access to the scene and who doesn't, and when you can clean the scene up and restore it to use for production again versus having to hold that scene open. Uh, we have seen, uh, in the case of that dust collector explosion, um, unfortunately, that incident scene was um, held, <clears throat> pardon me, held as uh, off limits for, uh, I think it was approximately three and a half weeks before everybody had collected all of their information and, and uh, artifacts to do their, uh, their proper uh, due diligence on the incident. Thank you. That's, that's actually pretty clear to me now. Um, okay, good. A couple of questions that surround interview processes. You spent quite a bit of time talking about that process, and a couple of questions yeah. have come up that I think are interesting. Uh, number one is, is there um, any set of templates 
or any kind of training that's available to folks who don't want to have to sort of learn on the job under fire to do that kind of interview? Um, the best method I've seen for that is um, individual training with an organization like ours. When when we when we come in to do this training for one of our clients, we're often doing some role play exercises and teaching those principles within the facility. And we would do that with the management team. So there's um, you know, we we can certainly do that. There's organizations that might be local to um, to uh, you know some of the members that are listening. Uh, we can certainly come out and do that even at a distance. Um, but uh, that's usually the best way to do that. Um, I've not actually seen a resource that I could guide somebody to over the internet or um, you know something like that that would go into more detail on that. Unfortunately. Okay. Okay, but th that leads to the next question, which is very much related. Um, is that something that a company should ask uh, inside or outside counsel to do, or is that something that the safety professionals should do? That's a great question. Um, so you'll find in the guide that we've provided for preparing for catastrophic incidents that there was a lot of discussion during that webinar about the response team. Uh, you do need in-house people because many of your incidents are going to be pretty minor and they won't require the level of sophistication or protection for the company that others will require. So um, if we're talking about small lacerations or near misses, most of that can be handled with uh, in-house folks, in-house resources. And, and I'm speaking generally. Some some of the people that may even be on our call are are very seasoned safety professionals who are working for very large organizations and and have the ability to handle very complex incidents. Um, many of the people that are on our call, though, I think probably the broadest band of our callers would be uh, folks who are dual responsibility operations with a safety title, safety responsibility. Um, when you get into very complex incidents. You're you're going to want outside counsel uh, engaged in the process, and oftentimes you'll want your outside counsel to engage a third party like an optimum that would come in and be the eyes and ears in the investigation and run that as a third party. And the reason for that is that all of our work, if we're engaged by a outside counsel, and I've heard some discussion between attorneys. I'm not an attorney, so I can't speak to this. But I have heard discussion between attorneys, and there's much debate as to whether or not an inside counsel can can um, actually secure an attorney-client work product privilege. Okay. Uh, this gets pretty detailed, but what, with outside counsel, if they secure third parties, all of the work that we do on that investigation is, is secured within the attorney-client privilege, and it's not discoverable in litigation down the road in the case of subrogation or third-party claims or any of the other litigation that comes out of these types of incidents. Um, and Chris, there is discussion of that in that old webinar. I think, well, yeah. Um, and, and so on that guide, there would be uh, some information there and I would say if anyone has questions on that, they can feel free to give us a call at the safety helpline, and, and I'd, I'd engage conversations like that with individual members um, to help with that. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, one last question, because we're, we're running out of time, but this goes into the area of root cause that you talked about. Um, is it the case that root causes will always ultimately be pretty obvious when you investigate far enough? Or are there actually cases where root causes are just fuzzy and can't be um, it can't be determined that there is one or even multiple uh, obvious root causes? Have you ever run into anything like that? <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the sticky wicket, right? As they say, of doing incident investigations, it's uh, yes. it's not always very easy. Um, 
Uh, one that comes to mind, I'll try and do this quickly, but one that comes to mind was a crane collapse with um, a uh, field erection service. Uh, so this was a construction-related activity, but um, what ended up happening was we, after a very long investigation and multiple conversations with the crane operator uh, and finding out exactly how his crane operated and what he had to do to set the crane up, we found out that he set up his crane indicator, which is called a LMI or load moment indicator. He set that up showing that the crane had additional counterweights on it that it did not have. So the crane calculated that it could reach further and with more weight than what it was capable of in its current configuration because he set it up wrong. And because we kept digging and looking at different owner's manuals and trying to really understand that, that root cause surfaced itself in about the 11th hour of the investigation. And instead of us just being able to say it was operator error, we were able to define the operator error all the way down to that issue, which then provided some additional repairs or fixes with automatic indicators that prevented it. So I think that's an example of what you're asking about. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think that is. All right, so I think we have about five minutes left. So, Steve, uh, we should probably move on to the wrap-up phase of our webinar. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. J just one quick uh, advertorial, <laughs> once again, for the MSCI Safety Conference. And, and uh, we talked about it earlier. I did anyway. Um, just as a reminder, this is a safety conference that is planned, developed, and delivered by metals industry safety professionals for the metals industry. It is no other safety conference like it. So if you're going to pick a safety conference to go to, this is the one to go to. And by the way, you'll meet a whole bunch of people, peers of yours, who have the same concerns, uh, and you it's a, just a great opportunity to get to know those folks and share notes, talk about best practices and things like that. So uh, thank you for showing that slide again, Steve. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just in closing, I do want to just remind everybody that Optimum does provide a safety management assessment service. Uh, we find this to be a great starting point for organizations who are uh, elevating folks within their operating environment into a safety role. It helps us to come in and assess where you are and help with gap analysis and training for those new safety professionals to set them up for success. So I would encourage you, if you're uh, in that role, maybe new for the first time, or you're wondering what am I missing in my safety process, uh, this is a great process to engage in. Feel free to give us a call here at Optimum on our safety helpline or through our regular office number, and we can talk about having an assessment like that done at your workplace. Uh, we've done them for a number of MSCI members. They're finding them a great benefit, and uh, we can even provide referrals on those if you're interested. Uh, any other questions as we come out of this uh, webinar, feel free to call us at the Safety Helpline. Here's the phone number. You can also email us at safetyhelpline at optimum-usa.com. And uh, again, I'll encourage you to take advantage of the handouts that are in the webinar center. Uh, if you have not gotten those yet or if we close that too soon for you today, feel free to email us at the Safety Helpline. Again, safetyhelpline at optimum-usa.com. We will gladly return those handouts back to you. And again, thank you on behalf of Optimum Safety Management and MSCI for attending today's webinar. Have a great day. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.